and I'm holding one of her uh, publications, Dangerous Turn Ahead, which I'm not sure if this is the uh, book a, or not. It's the book I've got out. It's a young adult. It's uh, targeted for boys 12 to 15. The main Whoops. character starts out at 15. Okay. Because I know you have something to, well, I'll let you explain yeah. that. Anyway, Sherry grew up in Syracuse, New York. Surrounded by German shepherds, spent her summers hiking. She and her husband owned and showed Afghan. Is that pronounced correctly? Yes, I believe so. Hounds for 10 years. Shepherds were her first love. 93, she purchased Taz, who led her to the world of canine search and rescue, where she continues to serve while using her expertise to teach others how to develop and apply these life saving skills. From Sun Cross for Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts, Sherry started volunteering as a merit badge counselor, assisting nearly 100 boys as they followed the path toward Eagle Scout. For over a decade now, through personal parental support, troop leadership, their troop had 35% of the scouts, including Sherry's son, earned her eagle rank. Uh, she brings authenticity <clears throat> of all these experiences into her writing. She and her husband of over 30 years currently live in Mundelein, near Chicago. They're usually accompanied by two of her canine partners, although Morris said they next had an idea today. <clears throat> and recently added just the right puppy to train next. Uh, Sherry, thanks for being here, and please welcome Sherry Gallagher. Yes, I'm vertically challenged. You need to bring the camera down. <laughs> Working on it, bringing it up. Yeah, there we go. All right. the, the focus of Dangerous Turn Ahead is the main character is a very big kid. He's a little behind in school, and he's being bullied by a much smaller student. And he's trying to, he doesn't want to hurt the other kid. He's trying to walk away, walk away. And it deals with <coughs> how to handle a bully. Um, the Greater Chicagoland Mental Health Association liked it so much they're putting it up on their website um, as for how it deals with bullying. In it, the, the boy is working for his Eagle Scout and he does achieve his Eagle Scout in the book. Um, I'm very proud of Eagle Scouts. It's not an easy thing to do. Only four out of every hundred scouts achieve the rank of Eagle. Um, and my son <laughs> got his Eagle at 13 which is almost unheard of. But he's kind of a focused kid. He said, you know, I'm going to, he told me when he joined Tiger Cubs that he was going to be an Eagle Scout, and he just kept working for that goal. Um, he's a student right now at Northern Illinois University in the School of Engineering, and I think he will be there probably for the next four years. He's already been there four years. <laughs> <laughs> he lost the focus. <laughs> College is an interesting time. <laughs> Um, he's a good kid. He has been working with us uh, to train the search dogs since we started doing the training in 1998. Uh, we would tell him, go get lost, and then use the dogs to go find him. The dogs were quite sure he was the most directionally challenged person they had ever met in their lives. You know, they'd be in their crates waiting, and he would start leaving, and they'd be like, yo, he's getting lost again, you know? Um, so he, but he has been at it. He's now training his own search and rescue dog. It takes about two years to train up your first search and rescue dog. Um, if you are already qualified and have done one dog and you've d done the um, play drive um, and motivational training with your puppy, then at, if you're at that point, it might take you a year or less. Uh, I currently have uh, one, F uh, one German Shepherd going on 11 years old. His name is um, Lecter of my bodyguard. I did not name him. Yes, he was named for Hannibal Lecter. He did bring them back alive, not slightly gnawed. Um, I retired him just this past year. And then uh, my current partner is Bellissima of my bodyguard, better known as Baby Belle, or the Bailey Girl of the German Shepherd World. Focus, 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 butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> but one amazing human remains dog. She can spot human remains faster than any dog I've ever seen. Uh, I am currently training an eight-month-old puppy. His name is Oryx von Tajitos. He is all black. Um, he's probably in about 60 pounds now. He's eight months old. Um, he has the mentality of a four-month-old, and everything is in the mouth. You never know what's going by. And say, Oryx, what have you got? <laughs> uh, but it's a lot of fun, and right now all we're working with is motivation. People ask me, when I say I do canine search and rescue, they go, oh, you rescue dogs. I know of a dog. No, 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 no. Um, I use my dogs to find lost people. Um, we don't look for other pets. I've had those calls. I had one lady who had 
Amazon turtles, and they wanted me to go look for them. I was like, no, we don't do that. We train the dogs not to chase animals, and that takes a lot of work sometimes. Um, we used to, all of our uh, members buy their own dog. Uh, when I bought Lecter, he was an adult dog with titles. I got a deal on him. He was only $4,000. Um, Oryx, I got a deal on him because I promised that I would campaign him in a sport of Schutzen to the national level. So he was only $2,000. Um, typically, you're spending around $2,000 to $3,000 for an eight-week-old puppy. From that point on, you're also going to be buying your equipment. You're going to be paying for training. So you are in out of your pocket, not including the time you spent, so you're not getting paid for your time, about $10,000 to get a dog operational. All of our members do that themselves. Um, and what we do when we go on searches, we never charge. Because what are you going to do, do? Say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I know your mother is missing, but you're 50 cents short of our expenses, so we're not looking for it. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise about $10,000 because that's what it costs to field a team for a week. Um, to pay for the gas, to pay for their food, and to put a cheap roof over their heads. Uh, we ask the family, if they can, to donate what they are capable of, but we never give them amount, an amount, and we take all donations. So one of the things that we do is we'll stand in front of a pet store and we'll beg, give us your dollar, please, please, please. Uh, and we'll bring the dogs out. They're a great, they're a great way to draw people in. Uh, and I had my dog, Clara, this was a few years ago, and we rotate them. We have them in crates, and we rotate the dogs out, and they're all friendly and cuddly and everything. And Clara was in the crate, and this lady gets out of her car, and she comes walking up, and she opens up the crate, and she gets Clara, and she hooks the leash on it, and she walks over, and she goes, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bet you will. <laughs> um, Clara's father was the top-ranked uh, Seeger dog in Germany when she was born. So this was a dog that was very expensive at the time. So they're going, yeah, that's about $100,000 worth of dog on the hoof. No, you're not taking her. She thought what we were doing was a rescue trying to find home for German Shepherds. I said, you got good taste, but no, give us money. <laughs> um, one of the questions I get sometimes is, how did you get into search and rescue? And particularly when I'm doing schools, I say, well, I did a very dangerous thing. I had a very obnoxious dog, and I read a book. I read a book, uh, So That Others May Live, by Caroline Hebart. And I had this very obnoxious dog that would mow my kid face first into a mud puddle. Um, he came in one day, you know, just coated in mud, doing the, ah, you know, when you count one, two, three, and then the sound comes out, you know you're in trouble. Um, we couldn't understand what was going on until he turned around and we saw the paw prints up his back. <laughs> must have been like a Roadrunner cartoon. Um, I read So That Others May Live, and Caroline described what she looked for in a search and rescue dog. And it was everything that this obnoxious dog was. So I contacted the, the address in the back of the book, flew back and forth to the East Coast a few times. They convinced me to start a team out here in Illinois. And um, the rest, is, as they say, is history. It took about two years of training every single Sunday. In order for us to become operational, we went operational as a team. We always field as a team. There's always at least two dogs and handlers. There's a base camp operator, and there's an incident commander. The incident commander tells us where to go. That's generally my husband. I tell him that's the only time he gets to tell me where to go. <laughs> um, the base camp operator is responsible for keeping us fed while we're in the field and also making sure that we are capable of continuing to search. Uh, when you come in, you've got your adrenaline running. You may have been out there for 12 hours. Yeah, give me another sign, but boy, I'm gone. And he sits you down and he says, yeah, what's your name? What day is it? Generally, we don't know either one. <laughs> um, then he asks us information about our dog. And if you understand and remember what, you're, what is good about your dog, then, then you're okay to go back in the field. Uh, but he takes care of us and keeps track of us. Uh, searches that I have been on. Uh, generally, search and rescue dogs are a tertiary effort. So I joke that, you know, they get called in after the police, after the fire department, um, after Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, we're always the last effort. We're a check mark in the box to see we called the dogs. Well, the problem you run into is most of you have seen on television, oh, the dog smells a piece of clothing, and then they follow the track. 
when you get a lot of traffic going back and forth across the track, it obliterates the track. It covers it. Yes, my dogs are trained to track. Yes, Lecter trained. Lecter did actually track a potential suicide in Joliet, in the pouring rain, across the jewel parking lot, across the road, to a Walgreens, past a Burger King, to a McDonald's, to a bank, ATM, to a bus stop. We radioed in, they started pinging. She was on a bus in Kentucky. She had been at the Walgreens. She had not been at the, at the Burger King. She had been at the McDonald's. This was about 2 o'clock in the morning by the time we finally got to this, so there was nobody at the bank to call. Um, but we figured she probably stopped and got some cash, and she got on the bus. But we don't normally get called that early. Uh, we get called 9, 10 months after someone's gone missing. There is no track. So what our dogs do is they follow the scent um, that comes off of the body. Everybody is a source of scent. You're sloughing off about 40,000 cells a minute. And that's going to carry the cosmetics, that's going to carry hormones, pheromones, and the dogs pick up that scent. It's carried in an ever-widening cone on the air. So we take the dogs off leash and say, go find, give me anything human out there. And they will give us evidence. So we're looking for a five-year-old. And we know that the five-year-old was wearing a blue hat. Well, we're out there searching, the dog finds a hat, it will tell me that it's found the hat because it has human scent on it. And I can radio back in, I found a blue hat, here's where I found it. Well, somebody else has found something else, a mitten. Well, you start drawing a line, you start getting a direction of travel, and somebody can get ahead of that direction of travel and find the person. It doesn't matter, I don't have to be the one that finds the person for it to be a successful search. Somebody on that search team has to make the find and save a life. If that's happened and I got to contribute to it, I'm happy. Um, that is kind of what we do, but a lot of times what we get called in for is closure. Uh, we got called in for a caribou hunter who had gone missing one degree south of the Arctic Circle. That was kind of a fun search and it was kind of a hard search. Uh, we flew out of Montreal. We were responsible for our expenses into Montreal. From there, they flew us a thousand miles north. We landed on a gravel strip. They put us on float planes and flew us 120 miles north-northwest. They dropped us and they left, and they came back a week later. Uh, we were responsible for taking care of ourselves and doing the searching. We cleared 15,000 acres with five dogs in five days. Um, unfortunately, all we could say is we found no evidence to indicate his location. But we would be given a kilometer by a kilometer, it's a thousand meters by a thousand meters square to search. And we might have to go 2,000 meters to get to that, and we'd be searching it. The dogs were hitting on shell casings that the caribou hunters had left from the previous fall season. So these had been through an Arctic winter, and the dogs were picking up on them. Um, Lecter found an individual coffee wrapper. Uh, he found some soda cans. Another dog found beer cans. We were finding cheesecloth that they'd used to wrap the caribou meat in. Uh, but we found no evidence to indicate his location. We did note that the wolves were sitting on boulders watching us at night when we were in the cabins. And there was two, they, they had two cabins made out of plywood. Um, the women's cabin we had to do some repairs to because the bears had ripped the siding off of it and had come in to see if they could find food. Always a warm and fuzzy feeling. <laughs> um, but yeah, we were out looking for that. Lecter slipped going in on the, on the float plane going in, drove the nail all the way back into his toe, and continued to do the search. He did the search anyway. Um, he's a pretty good dog. Uh, we would get, so we were walking on boulders about the size of a microwave, completely rounded, so you'd slip. You were constantly slipping. By the time I got out of there, my knees hurt so bad, don't ask me to stand up, was the, was the routine, and my ankles were all beat up. Well, search dogs fly in the cabins. And of course, once we got back in, you know, got everything packed up, and I had a five o'clock flight out, so you gotta be there two hours beforehand. Now, Lecter was originally trained to be a high-intensity protection dog. And so I had to do a lot of work with him to not be a protection dog. So, you know, one of the things we had to work on was when you go through security, 
Well, most of the time I just, you know, I take his collar off, I put him on a sit stay, I'd go through the thing, and then call him through. Well, don't I get, oh, you're the fun one that gets to be wanded? Well, my dog was trained that if somebody comes at me with a stick, he doesn't wait for a man to attack. So I'm sitting there going, okay, can I put my dog on a down stay in front of me? And the guy was just being a real jerk that morning. And he said, no, you will put him on a down stay back there. So here I am standing here, and this guy is going at me with a wand, and I'm trying not to flinch, going, plots fly, plots fly, which is downstay. Going, please don't eat the guy, please don't eat the guy, just want to get out of here. <laughs> which he did. Um, and he was really, really good about it. And when we got on the airplane, of course, we're both exhausted. And he flies in the cabin, and he's supposed to sit just at my seat. Well, I sat in my seat, and there was nobody next to me, and he laid down. And we both fell asleep, you know, we're over there. Both the dog and I had our tongue hanging out. <laughs> and I woke up, the flight attendant had covered him up with a blanket, she covered me up with a blanket, and she's stepping over his head to serve coffee. <laughs> uh, it, it is, when you're doing a recovery search, you're trying to bring closure so you can work safely. That's one of the differences. When you are on a live find search, you take risks. You risk you or you risk your dog. But a recovery search you can enjoy. Now I'm down to five minutes. Uh, we're German Shepherd Search and Rescue Dog Association. We only use German Shepherds. Um, I'm gonna take questions from here on out. Unless you don't have questions and then I'll keep babbling. What was the most amazing um, rescue you've ever had? Most gratifying? Well, Lecter and I, Lecter's a big dog. He travels long distances. He searches like crazy. He went through walls actually to try and find some people. Um, and I'm a good walker. So we're generally out where there's very little likelihood. We, a couple years ago, we were asked to find a hiker. And there was uh, an abandoned ore plant. And Lecter was the only dog there who had disaster training. So I sent him and really steep slag pile. He had to go down that and then search a level of, of collapsed building and then down another slag pile and a level. Went down the first one, searched the level, went down the second one and he stopped on the second one going down and he slid and the slag took him down to the building and he came up. And he stood and he looked at it and he gave me his cheek going, found it. Oh. And I went, no, right? I went, okay, you got to give me your alert. So then he gave me his trained alert and I went, oh, now what do I do? Because uh, it's been so long since I'd actually been any place where I actually was going to find anyone. So I put him up and I pulled Belle out. And she said, yep, same place, right here. So we called in and we brought, the, we brought in two more team dogs and then the Ontario Provincial Police came in. What it turned out was um, it was a hiker who had been missing nine months. She had fallen into a river, washed out into Lake Superior, been washed up on the shore. A fox had taken a portion of the body back, fed its kits and he had found bits of bone the size of the pea in a fox den. Um, that tracking one, that was, I, I was really proud of him because we really don't do, tra we do tracking just to keep their noses exercised, but we really don't use that in the field. Um, so yeah, that was probably one of, one of the most exciting ones I've ever done. Yes? Sherry, I know it's got to be a terrifically involved process, but how do you go about training a dog to find your mates? Well, you teach them, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to motivate the dog. So you teach them to play. And you teach them whenever I tell you this command, you're going to get played with. We start out with lifeline, and then what we do is we put human hair in like a plastic bottle. And they love to crunch on the plastic water bottles. And we use that and we play fetch with them. So they get used to human hair as a scent. Then what we start doing is we hide the human hair. Then we'll start hiding uh, bone. We'll start hiding blood. You know, we're really kind of sick people. You cut yourself. Oh, quick, let me have some. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, it's interesting. Uh, dogs won't search for their hand own handler's blood. They won't wear that. They know where the handler is. So, but that's, you know, you start hiding it. And when they find it, you play with them. Um, quick one, Lecter. I was doing a disaster training, and the guy, the lady said, okay, where are, you know, I come walking up, there's 30 people doing this disaster training, I give her the toy, she gives it to the subject, the subject goes, hi, and when I, I walk up, she goes, this one. 
I went, what? She goes, no, no, it's fine. it's fine. So she goes, send your dog. Well, I'm 50 yards away in another room, and I'm not allowed to hear. All I hear is, crash, crash, crash. And I hear him start barking. He's made his find. So I go up, and, you know, what was the problem? She said, well, I was giving the toy, and the guy was dropping down that hole up there at the top behind the wall. And I said, well, why didn't he just go through this hole? He goes, because your dog just made it. He went through drywall to get to the subject. <gasps> Um, you know, Lecter is not an easygoing dog, <laughs> but if you're in a building and it's falling down on top of you, who do you want looking for you? Um, just quickly, I have trading cards for Lecter and Baby Bell. They're up there. Take whatever you need or want for your kids, grandkids, whatever. Um, Pam has a fishbowl. Uh, this is a book I'm giving away. There's five. These are all true dog stories. Five of them are mine. One of them is all about Lecter. One of them is all about who I, uh, uh, how I got into search and rescue, how I got into dogs, how they saved my life twice. Do I go to the next kind of question? Yeah. Next question. Um, do you ever do demonstrations or uh, for Boy Scouts? All the time. Okay. Right. If you got a troop, I'm always up for doing Boy Scout troops. Awesome. You want this? We'll talk. <laughs> troops, packs. Yeah. I, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't tell you who it would have been. I can't. It's Gary Coleman. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time? Uh, Go on up. Oh, thank you. Technicon. Can we talk about that for a session? Okay. Um, since I don't get paid, and generally I take money out of my pocket to do searches, uh, I am a quality and environmental consultant and process consultant. I have over 30 years' experience as an engineer and as the chief quality officer in manufacturing. I've done plastic injection molding, steel stamping, forging, electronics. Um, at one point in time, I had plants in Canada, the US, Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia that I had to keep in line with Zell, Germany. Um, if any of you have ever heard of ISO 9000, uh, it's a quality standard, an international quality standard. I've been implementing it since 1988 when it came out. I am an independent consultant. I have been an independent consultant since 2001, implementing quality and environmental standards. What I look at and say is a business owner is in business to make money. So how do I take quality and how do I take reducing waste and help them to reduce costs? Um, I also help them if they have quality problems. You know, one of the jokes is most of my clients call me when they're up the unsanitary tributary without a visible means of locomotion. Um, yeah, I think that went through. Uh, they've got a client who's going to leave if they don't get certified. They've got a client who's going to leave if they don't fix a quality problem. They've got a client who, they've got the low bid, but if they don't get certified, they're going to have their bid thrown out. That's when I get called in and I make it happen. All right. Awesome. Any other questions? You ever want to come out and train with us? You're more than welcome, but only German Shepherds. Why only German Shepherds? When we train with a single breed, it's easier to train handlers because you can send out any experienced handler with them and they can read the body language of the dog and say, look, 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 this is what your dog is doing. It varies slightly from duck breed to breed. So the difference between a Golden and a German Shepherd is like the difference between French and Spanish. Very close, but not quite there. Uh, German Shepherds have been never been bred to hunt or retrieve game, so they don't get tired and alert on birds and deer and things like that. They have a double coat. I've been out searching at 103 degrees air temperature, and I've been out searching at minus 25, and my dog did a whole lot better than me. <laughs> um, and they like to be trained. I mean, my Afghan hound had a great nose. But you, told, you threw a toy and went, you threw it, you get it. <laughs> um, whereas Ger German Shepherd, you say jump, I, I'm goes, like how that. high, how high, how high? Okay. Well, um, there's so more like that's that. That's why we use only German Shepherds. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much.